Genesis chapter 5. So, awesome book. There's a lot about marriage here, and we're going to talk a little bit about marriage and, and family here, but not too much. Um, but the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings, as I said before. Uh, in chapter 1 and 2, you have the creation. Chapter 2 gives us a, 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 a recount of the history in more detail. In chapter 3, we see the fall of man, where Adam and Eve sinned, and sin entered into the world. And God then uh, prophetically um, shared with Eve and Adam how he would take care of the sins of the world through his son, Jesus Christ. You see that in, John, in, in Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> and then we saw in chapter 4 uh, the, um, the um, first man to murder someone, the son of Adam and Eve. And now in chapter 5, it just seems to be um, getting worse when we get to chapter 6 where all of a sudden you see the total corruption of mankind. And we're kind of living in that, that day and age today. But chapter 5 is, is kind of refreshing because it gives us a genealogy uh, of Adam through Noah. <clears throat> and we see that there were some that were faithful. There were some that did surrender their lives to Jesus, to Jesus Christ or to God. And they were walking with God. So a person who surrenders and walks with God finds his peace and purpose in that. When we surrender our lives totally to God, when, when we finally say, Lord, of my own free will, I give you my life. You give me direction and I'll follow you. As I read your word and as you guide and lead me, I will be obedient to follow your word. And when you walk with God, when you're obedient to his word, you find peace that only comes from him. And not only peace, but purpose in life. I remember <clears throat> when I got saved and I started going to a Calvary chapel and I had already gone through the, the whole Bible reading the whole things and, and then listening to K-Wave and other Christian stations um, on the radio. And I just learned so much. And I really never had purpose in life. I just existed like everyone else in the world, right? You, you, you graduate and your purpose is to get a job and then finally marry someone, raise a family, and you do what your parents did, and hopefully it turns out okay. That's what you hope for, make as much money as you can, enjoy life, and then you die. And that's how I just viewed things. <clears throat> and, and so there was really no purpose but to exist, and then it was all over. But when I came to the Lord and began to have all this knowledge of God and who he was as I was studying and I began to go to church, uh, people would be in conversations and they would be asking each other questions and I would, I would answer the questions because I knew the answers from all the studying that I had done, from the radio that I listened to, and I, I just answered them. And, and next thing you know, they started crowding around me. And I thought that was so weird because I had never had that before. I have never had purpose in my life to exist, to actually have information to give to someone else. And it was just kind of funny that all of a sudden one day uh, the leadership came to me and said, hey, it looks like you're an elder. Uh, you're ministering to the people. You answer their questions. You're giving them direction and so forth. So would you like to be an elder? And I'm like, well, okay, I guess, you know, and it just kind of led that way. Uh, I found peace in God for my life because the old life didn't give me any peace. I was drinking. I was taking drugs. I was out partying. I was trying to find peace, but I could never find it in all that stuff. But I found it in Jesus Christ because he forgave me of my sins and he put me on a path of righteousness to, with purpose. And I found the peace of God there. So we find in this chapter that you can find peace when you walk with God, and we'll see that with Enoch. In this chapter, as I said, we have the genealogy of Adam through Noah. <clears throat> and then from Noah, it just declines, and then God has to do something about it. We will recall the creation in verses 1 and 2. God wants to remind us that we were created, and he's our God, and he's our creator. And then we will see the genealogy of Adam, or you might even say humankind, and then the godliness of Enoch who walked with God and then he was not. And that's just a way of saying he was taken up into heaven. And then the birth of <clears throat> Noah here. So it will go kind of fast today, but hopefully you'll, you'll gain some information and the Spirit will minister to you and answer some questions that you might have. Now, <clears throat> Moses will recount the creation of man and woman and how God had called them to be fruitful and multiply, to populate the earth. Uh, 
that was his plan for their specific life to be fruitful and multiply the earth so that the earth would be full of those who would believe and worship God. So this is the book of the genealogy of Adam, verse 1 says. It could be said of Adam that Moses is referring to humankind, and I'll define Adam in a moment, uh, and you'll see why. He might not be talking literally about Adam himself, but Adam being the beginning of humankind. The phrase, this is the book, is often used in the Bible. And as you read through the Bible, Bible in Numbers, and Joshua, Samuel, and even in, in the New Testament in, in um, Jude, though it doesn't say in this book, but Jude has written down some documents for us. Um, I'm sorry, Jude, but Enoch has written down some prophetic words for us. Uh, but this is a phrase that's used because there are books, other books, the books of war of the Lord's, Numbers 21, 14, the book of Jasper. You probably have heard, heard that word used before. Now, we have to be careful because we don't have those books. They're not canonical books. Uh, some have professed to have books like the book of Enoch, but it's not in the scriptures. There's so, probably some some contradictions to what we have already, which is canon. And so those books sometimes are what we call apocryphas that, that the Catholic Church puts in between the, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they're just extra books that they have out there. Whether they were written by the original author or whether they were written afterwards, we really don't know. But they contradict the, the basic understanding of, of God. Uh, some, some of it's even weird. Uh, so you just have to be careful and study those books really well and then compare them to the scriptures. And we always compare to scriptures, right? Everything we always compare to scriptures because scripture is true. Everything else is second to that. So uh, they didn't have books like we have today. You know, you go to my house and you go into my library and you'll see, I don't know, about five sh bookshelves from floor to ceiling and they're filled with books. Uh, filled with all kinds of books by authors and di various sizes. Some of them are small books. Some of them are, are volumes of books. Some of them are, are like uh, 12 volumes of books. And I love those uh, biblical library books that I have. They're just such awesome books. But back then, they didn't write like that. They wrote on stone. They wrote on parchment paper or vellum. They, they, they put it together or sewed it together, and they made rolls with it. And they term these things books. You could have a small little writing by someone and they considered it a book. And so it's a little different than ours, whether large or small, it was considered a book. So this was the book of Adam. And in that day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. <laughs> so again, here God recounts in verses 1 and 2. He just wants us to pause for a second, be reminded that God created Adam and Eve. This is where we came from. And we need to be reminded of that uh, very often, that, that we are created, that we didn't evolve, and that we are accountable and responsible for what God has given to us, just as he gave Adam the responsibility to govern over the world, to have dominion over the world. And so we have what they call in the New Testament stewardship. And so we are stewards of the things that God has given us because he has given them to us as his creatures. So as parents, we are responsible for our children to teach them in biblical principles, to bring them to church, to encourage them. And if they don't want to come to church, then encourage them in different ways to come to church, but they need to come to church. That is our responsibility so that they understand that church is a place that you need to go to. Church is a place where you will grow, that you'll gain uh, training and equipping and so forth. Even though they might not want it at that time, they'll appreciate it later on as we all did once we became adults but we have to be reminded that God created us and we're in his likeness and so we need to take on those attributes of God as we walk on this world we are to be righteous as he is righteous we're to be godly as he is godly we're to be holy as he is holy and so these are the attributes of God that we need to put on and so we're not just animals out there we have responsibility so he is our creator <clears throat> And sometimes we even fight against that, the fact that he is our creator, because we're stubborn. We want to do our own thing. We want to go our own way. And God gives us options every single day. There, there, there are options every day. And that's what's so, so uh, interesting about life, right? Uh, you have 100 different options in a day. 
You wake up in the morning and you can pretty much, at least in this, in, in this United States, you can pretty much do whatever you want to do. You can go in one direction or another direction. You can sleep in if you want to. You can miss work and call in sick, though you're not sick. And you can just do whatever you want to do because we just have those op options here. And God gives us those options. It's called free will. <clears throat> and we have that free will. But we need to walk according to his plan. What is his plan? And how do I know his plan? And how do I find out that plan? Well, how about asking him what that plan is? How about just looking how about observing what your responsibilities are and then you'll know what his plans are for your life one is if you're married and you have a wife then you love your wife you love your husband uh, you love your children you have a responsibility there you have to take care of them so you have to go to work and not call in sick so you can go to the concert even though you're not sick so you know you have a responsibility and i totally get it that sometimes you do because i've done that before too <laughs> call in sick when I'm not sick to go somewhere else you have that free choice and, and God still loves us even though we do things like that God still cares about us uh, even though we enjoy times like that and, and we just come back to him and say okay what is your plan for me and so every morning uh, I wake up or if I'm here we have our devotions and we always ask the Lord after we have our devotions Lord you you run our day we're going to do administration work, we're going to do yard work, we're going to do this and that. But if you want to change that, then we have to be open to that. You lead us and guide us today. You may interrupt it any time you want, but help us to do what we know we need to do and be responsible with that and just trust in you. We have to ask God, what is your plan for us today? And not fight that plan for our lives. You know, when we fight against God, that's when we are stressed. That's when, when um, life isn't, easy that's when there's no peace that's when there's no rest but if we take his yoke he takes our burdens and he gives us the rest and peace for our lives so really he created us with a plan and purpose and so remember he is your creator and he loves you to death and he has created you with a purpose and a plan that would please him so he created them male and female and he blessed them so he blessed them in their marriage. It was God who performed the first wedding ceremony here. He literally blessed them. Got them together and I bless you. Now go and be fruitful and multiply. I'd like to do that one day when I do a, a wedding ceremony. Bless you. Now be fruitful. Go and multiply the earth. <laughs> that would be a good one to do. <laughs> and so that's God's plan for us even today. It's still his plan for us to love one another as, as couples and then raise children to also love God and to love their family and, and to understand that protecting the family is the number one priority that we have as Christians because without the family, this world crumbles and we see it crumbling because family is so torn apart. And so we have that responsibility. That is the plan of God. Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted you to divorce your wives. Because it wasn't so from the beginning. <clears throat> God's plan was not for that. God did not want divorce. And he still doesn't want divorce. In fact, he says he hates divorce. Because he sees what it does to the family. To the children, most of all. We should be looking at our children. God declared Adam and Eve to be man. Adam. And God declared that. In other words, you're one. You're not two distinct individuals you are one one individual and when you marry that person you become one there's only one reason for divorce and the bible is clear on that and that's fornication or adultery which is the same thing <clears throat> you can find that in matthew chapter 19 there is no other reason for divorce and so that word should not be a part of the christian vocabulary and you should do everything you can to stop that divorce from happening because it's not what god wants john corson said this if you married your husband or wife without seeking god's guidance or will or direction do people really do that yeah they do all the time <clears throat> all the time well i'm in love i saw our first sight and we just fell in love and we're gonna go get married 
are you sure? <laughs> Could you go get some counseling? Could you see if she's a Christian? Could you, you know, there's a lot of things you've got to be asking yourself before you just go and get married, but people do it all the time. But he goes on and says, without God's guidance or direction, even if there are 4,999 people who would have been more suited to you in God's economy, the moment you said, I do to that person, the 5,000 instantly becomes one. One. No one will make you more happier than the one that you have married. God put you together for a purpose and a reason. You may have made a mistake. You may not have chosen the right one, but he put you with that one, and that is the right one. And no one else can make you happier than that person that you are married to. You have to understand that because that is God's perfect plan for your life. That is why it should make you happy. And you should pursue to... Um, work or suffer through the love that you're supposed to suffer through to love one another whatever it takes we need to be determined to work on our marriage and if that means to humble ourselves then we need to humble ourselves well wait a minute but the scriptures if you read Ephesians if you read this scripture over here and there's roles yes there's roles but Jesus also said that we need to be humble in those roles and so we need to understand the humility of God it was funny, I posted something on Facebook. Somebody had made the remark that, <clears throat> that if you, if, a mer if oh, what was it? Um, let's see if I remember it. It said, if you murder a murderer, it doesn't make one less murderer because you're a murderer, right? And so then I wrote, I said, well, you can kill a murderer and there's one less murderer. And someone else wrote on there, wait a minute, mathematically that doesn't make sense because it's still premeditated murder. And so I says, you wait a minute, theologically it makes all the sense because it's good and evil. And what was so funny after that, because you expect a fight and something like that, right? So I was expecting a, a comeback and I was like, okay, we're going to duke it out, you know, back and forth. I'm going to give us some scriptures. And, and they immediately came back and says, oh, you're right and big smiley face and I was blown away by that I'm like wow they conceded they just you know you're right and they humbled themselves and I was just so moved I said wow I am moved I am humbled by you admitting that I was right I was totally humbled by that because I don't see that too often people will, will keep fighting even though they know they're wrong because they want to be right we have to understand the humility that goes along with our roles too but we need to be determined Write that word down there, determine. We have to be determined that no matter what we've been through, no matter where we've been, you and I will do whatever it takes to guard the sanctity of marriage. And boy, we need that more and more today than ever before. We have to guard ourselves. Is marriage hard? Yes, it's hard. You better believe it's hard. Do you get in arguments? Of course you do, but you don't give up. Because that's the person you made a vow to, not a promise, a covenant. And covenants you don't break unless God breaks it by taking one of you home or one of you commits adultery, which literally destroys the whole family, including the children that are part of that family. But that is God's plan for our lives to love one another as husband and wife and to work through the difficulties. And if that means that you have to go get counseling, then go get counseling, but you have to humble yourself to the Word of God. And really that's the key, humbling yourself to the Word of God, taking your role, embracing your role. This is my role. I'm going to live it out because this is God's plan for my life, and I'm going to live it out to please Him and Him only. And boy, you find peace in that, and you have peace in your marriage. <clears throat> so he called them mankind in the day they were created. You could probably say they call them humans. It's the same word uh, in the Hebrew. I'm going to skip a few things there. Let's go over to verse 3 through 21. Let's look at this genealogy. We're going to run through this kind of quickly. 
That's why I spent a little time in the beginning there. But notice how long they lived here. Uh, and I think I mentioned this uh, a couple studies ago, why they lived so long because of the way that the earth was created and the canopy that was around it. You know, in the, the perfect environment, uh, their DNA was not uh, destroyed because of sin. It hadn't been long enough, so they had lived longer. Their longevity was there uh, by God's grace, and so Adam could live, you know, 900 and something years. So Adam, uh, he, let me give you the definition of some names here. You might want to write this down in your Bible because this is interesting, and, and I'll make a point here at the end. But the word Adam means man. So you might want to write next to Adam, man. Adam, man, lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness. So like God, created Adam and Eve in his likeness. So now Adam is fruitful. He multiplies and he creates man in his likeness. After his image and named him Seth. Now Seth, write down, appointed. Appointed. That's what his name means in the Hebrew, appointed. Cain is not, in, not mentioned in this chapter because he's a different genealogy right? We're looking at the genealogy of Jesus Christ. You go to Matthew chapter 1, and it gives you uh, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, which is very clear, very simple. Uh, you can't mistake the fact that Jesus comes from the lineage of David all the way back to Adam, and so he is the Messiah that's to sit on the throne of David. Verse 4, after he begot Seth, remember, Seth means appointed, the day of Adam's were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. Now that means that he populated the earth. He was fruitful. So all the days of Adam li lived were 930 years. That's a good old age, right? 930. That's a long time. <clears throat> Where's the peak in that? You know, 30 is the peak. I think 30 is like psh, prime. That's life. That's when, that's when you can do anything at the age of, of 30, you know, and then, then comes 50 and you're starting to fall apart, at least for me. <laughs> I asked my chiropractor the other day, I'm 54, am I supposed to go through all of this stuff? And he goes, yeah, this is when it begins. Because I asked him as a doctor, when you see patients, what's the average age? He goes, this is when it begins. I'm like, wow, and it gets worse. Thank God that it's not lasting. So, What's, 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 as I said, what's the peak of 900, you know, right? Like, is, is it 450? I don't know. But you think 450, and in our thoughts, we're thinking, man, that's old. What could he do at 450? Well, 900, you know, and he's still having kids, you know, so he could do a lot. <clears throat> but unfortunately, because of sin, he died. And God's word came true because he ate of that tree and if the, you eat of the tree, you die. And so, unfortunately, he still died. Whether 900 or whether 90, the wages of sin is death. And so every one of us definitely will die one day. Wow. How we die and with who we die really matters. Make sure you have Jesus. Seth lived 105 years and begot uh, Enosh. Now, Enosh means subject to death in the Hebrew. Subject to death. After he begot Enosh, subject to death, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Sin continues. Uh, that's uh, an equation that will always be the same. It's never going to stop. We all die. Enosh lived 90 years, and begot uh, Canaan. Canaan means sorrowful, sorrowful. So Enosh means subject to death. Canaan means sorrowful. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 850, 15 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalab. After he begot Mahalalath, which means from the presence of God. From the presence of God. So sorrowful, Canaan, and then Manahaleel means the, from the presence of God. Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. And all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. Manahaleel lived 65 years and begot Jared. He begot Jared, which means one comes down. One comes down. Mahalei lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. 
So all the days of Mahalai were 895 years, and he died. Jared lived 162 years. One who comes down lived, one, six, lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Enoch means dedicated, and, and we know he was really dedicated. Uh, sometimes uh, when you look in the, in the scriptures, it's interesting that, that, um, that when they would name the child, God would also give them a personality of that name. I don't know how that works. I'm still trying to figure it out, so I'm not really sure. You know, this is my idea, but it's just interesting. Uh, for me, it's kind of evidence that there is a God because you name your child, and then your child just kind of turns out to be like the meaning of his name. I mean, I know people who have been named some strange names, and then you, you watch them, and you look up the name, or it's a biblical name, and you go, wow. They actually are acting like that person was in the, in the Bible. I shared with you Reuben. Uh, Reuben has several different names, but unstable as water. And I'm going, man, I am at times. I'm just so with the emotionally up and down at times, just I'm unstable. God, why this? Why, 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 why? You know, I'm always going up and down. And it's not that that's my personality. And like my parents knew what my personality would be. But God just kind of seems to do that. So be careful when you name your children. I'm serious. That's that's my thought. Be careful what you you don't want to name him Judas. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You just don't want to do that. You know, I mean, uh, that's that's a tough one. You know, or Hitler, something like that. You just don't want to go that way. I mean, because you just don't know. I, I'm you know, you just check it out. Check some names out and watch the people. So Enoch is dedicated. Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch uh, lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. Now, this is the birth of Enoch, and we're going to stop and, and look at him a little bit here in verses 22 and 24, because he was a godly man. He's a man you want to fashion after, you want to follow, you want to figure out. You know, what did he do right? And I want to do that right too so that God can bless me. So Methuselah, which means dying he shall send. That's an interesting name. Dying he shall send. Now, why did, he, why did they name him that? Dying he shall send? Well, this is what God did. Because after he died, what did God send? The flood. He was the last one to die and then the flood came. And then there was no one. So Interesting. Let's look at Enoch for a second here, because it says that Enoch walked with God 300 years. Whew, that's a long time. I've walked with God 30 years. That's 10% of what he walked with God. 30 years is not a long time. Pastor Chuck has walked with God when he was here on earth 80, 80 years or so, because he's walked with God ever since he was a young child. But 300 years, that's a, a long time to make all the right decisions, you know. It, it, nowhere in there does it ever record that he made bad decisions or that he was a sinner or he confessed his sin. He was a sinner. Definitely he was man. But it, God never records any of that because he was pleasing to God in everything that he did to live 300 years walking with God. And he had sons and daughters, by the way. So he had a family. He had a wife. And he had children, and he walked before his children, before God. And he raised those sons and daughters right, because that's part of walking with God. He was a righteous man. So all the days of Enoch were 360 years, and Enoch walked with God. Now he says it twice here, doesn't he? Just to emphasize his righteousness. That's how awesome this guy was. He was just a, a guy that really pleased God. How'd you like to be a person that really pleases God? That should be all of our heart's desire to please God and to know that God's up there just smiling, going, yeah, that's my boy. That's my girl. And they're just pleasing you because you're walking in righteousness. It says it twice. And he was not. That's a... Uh, poetic way or an expression of saying that he didn't die 
he was actually taken because God took him. So he didn't die, but God took him. So Enoch did not die like everyone else died. Hebrews 11 verse 5 confirms that he did not die. He didn't have a, a physical organ cease at all, just stop working. His heart didn't fail. You know, he didn't have an accident. God just took him, simply just lifted him up and took him into his presence. Somehow he took his body and he probably either, he had to have transformed it and taken it to heaven because evil cannot dwell with God. And so he had to have a new body. Now, let's think about this. I'm going to take some time here because this is interesting stuff here for me. I love this stuff. You have to ask yourself, how did God take him up? Because we know in the New Testament in Luke that there's two places, right? The Old Testament people went to Abraham's bosom. Everybody else was in Hades. So did he not go to Abraham's bosom? doesn't say that. It says he, God took him up. And then his body didn't die. So his body's not on earth anywhere. His body was transformed into a new body. And so his body's in heaven without dying, which is interesting. Because Hebrews tells us that it's appointed a man to die once and then the judgment. So he didn't die. Well, wait a minute. Doesn't Hebrews say that it's appointed for every man to die once? That's interesting too. We find that Elijah also didn't die. Elijah, you remember him? He was also taken and he came back with chariot of fires. Now, some believe that uh, Enoch and Elijah and possibly Moses, there's some indication that Moses will be the two witnesses there in the tribulation period. But we're not sure whether that's true or not. But you know what? There will be others who will also walk with God and they will be taken. Do you know that? And you might be those others. Isn't that interesting? Because Thessalonians only tells us that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together, 417, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air at the rapture. So Hebrews chapter 9, I believe it is, has to mean something else. It's appointed a man to die once. The emphasis isn't on that being a matter of a fact. The emphasis is on something else. So if we have that opportunity, isn't that awesome? We have the opportunity of not dying. The rapture taking place, our body is going to meet the Lord. The, the dead in Christ first, because their spirits are with the Lord now, without a body. And when he comes to receive us, the bodies, which are scattered all over the earth, depending on where they're at, will all of a sudden meet their souls in heaven and they'll have their new bodies. We who are alive, just whoop, we're gone. Our clothes are here, just laying down. And some of you might be left behind. I don't know, because I don't know your hearts. Or hopefully we all go. That would be wonderful. If you're pleasing God, you'll go. And you'll go before the Lord. We'll be caught up in the air before him. So it's something that will happen again. And we should be looking forward to it. Now, God doesn't break his word. God can't break his word because it's his word. So if Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says it's appointed a man to die once, what is he really talking about? You have to read the context there because I think what he's talking about is a bigger picture than anything else. <coughs> Enoch is a type of the rapture. He's walking with God. He has a son, Methuselah. Methuselah dies. God sends the flood to destroy the earth. He's raptured out. The Jews, Noah and his family, go through the flood. God protects them as they're going through this flood that's a type of the tribulation and so you go to the new testament we're raptured out and when we're raptured out the tribulation begins seven years and israel is going to be dealt with during those seven years those that are left behind will also be dealt with so it could be that god is speaking more about the rapture and giving a bigger picture there in hebrews but if you read the context in hebrews uh, verse 28 says this in the context. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So I really think that the context is, is look, that it's appointed a man to die, but not all men will die. But here's my point. God's work on the cross was enough. It was sufficient. It takes care of everything. It is the offering that, that, that satisfied God completely. And so whether you die or taken up, that is what you need to believe in, is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. 
I don't believe that God breaks his word. Enoch's an interesting guy. There's a lot of typologies there, and, and we can draw so much information uh, from him. A part of his righteousness we find in Jude, verse 14, Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied these things. Now, Jude talks about these men who creep into the church in the last days and how they bring dissension and division and so forth. Enoch prophesied this way back in Genesis that this would happen. Jude records it, that this is what Enoch says. Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So he's talking about a judgment that's coming against the ungodly people and all the things that they have committed against God. And even the words that they've spoken against God, God is going to judge. So in a sense, Enoch was a prophet also as a righteous man <clears throat> being described the seventh of Adam. He's also a type of the perfect human being. If you want to be anyone, Enoch's the guy that you want to walk like. He walked with God 300 years and God took him like Elijah also took him. The phrase walking with God or walked with God is used also of Noah and his life spent in meditation, in conversation with God. It is a life of communion with the Lord. It's a life of intimacy with God. We as believers need to have an intimate life with God, a devotional life where we're speaking and talking with him on a daily basis. We have to wake up in the morning in prayer and in devotion to the Lord. It is a relationship. It is greater than our marriage relationship. And if you're not married, then he is your spouse. And he is to commune with you. You are to have intimacy with him. That is what walking with God is all about. And I know that some of you are new to this, but you have to change the way that you view God. He is not just this great, huge, supreme being that is so huge and that you can't touch and feel. You can literally touch and feel him. He is so big, but he is so small to come and commune with you because he loves you and he loves the fact that you spend time with him and he loves to give you his heart and his love, his peace, and his, he loves pouring it into you if you spend time with him. He loves it that you walk with him. Um, in the epistle of Hebrews, we see more of Enoch's life. Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. So faith has a lot to play with our walking with God. A lot of it is just steps of faith. Not seeing, not understanding, not knowing, but we do it by faith. When we bought this building, it was by faith. We didn't know if God wanted us here. We were in, the, in, in our house we were getting packed in the house. I was driving around. I saw this place. There was a fence around it. And I thought, man, that place is empty. Let's see if uh, we can come here. And so I, I went to my computer at Edison because it has all kinds of information. Looked up the address, found who owned it, called them up. And I said, hey, by faith, all this is just like, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. He might just say no. And he said, yeah, let's do it. And so we leased the building by faith. Now, we've been trying by faith to purchase another building, but it's not happening. We had the faith. We, we took the steps, but God's plan is no. We want you here right now, and that's why we're here. And that's what faith is. It is just taking steps of faith, trusting that God will open doors, and if he shuts the doors, then you go through another door, and you just walk like that in faith. If you're in a situation with your spouse, if you're in a financial crisis, you walk by faith. God will get me out of this. I need to be a good steward. I need to rein back. I need to cut back. I need to focus. Am I giving to him? Uh, am I giving what he wants? Am I doing the right things? And then by faith, you trust that he's, he will get you out. I was in that situation years ago. When I was working for Edison, I was living on $300. Virginia and I, was li not me. Virginia and, I and the kids were living on $300 a month. I take my my uh, SCE credit union card and I pay all my bills and I had no money. I take my $300, pay the card. I had $300 a use for the month. And I did that for years just with $300 living on that because we just were spending all over the place. And I started looking into uh, bankruptcy 
started to f- trying to figure out how to get out of this. I mean, I was sweating it. Finally, I'm like, Lord, I have to trust in you. I'm not going to go bankruptcy. I'm not going to say, sorry, can't pay you, and then not pay them. I don't want to do that. I want to pay my bills because I'm responsible to do that. So you need to get me out of this, and I'm trusting you. And like within several months, I get this journeyman's job. And that's where you want to be because those guys worked overtime like crazy. And so all of a sudden, this money just started pouring in. I said, no, we're not spending. We are paying off bills. And that's what we did. We paid everything off where we got totally debt free. But it's by faith. You trust in God. You lay it out before him, and he handles it. And those are the things that please him. So Enoch, his faith, is what translated him that he would not see death there. And it goes on and says that this was his testimony that he pleased God, that he pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please him. So you have to have faith. When you're doubting, you're not having faith. So when you're doubting, confess, Lord, I'm sorry for doubting you. I'm going to trust in you again and have faith. That's what faith is. So Enoch and Elijah were viewed as some of the most uh, historical people in the Old Testament. And we may see them again uh, in and during the tribulation period. Now, you notice also one thing about Enoch, he had kids. And having kids does something to you, too. It should do something to you. It should give you a sense of responsibility. It should give you a sense uh, of, of commitment to train them and to lead them and guide them, but not only that, but to live before them a godly life. And I think that's what Enoch's kids did, that he wanted to be an example to them. He wanted to pour his heart into them as he was raising his children. It brings them an awareness and a need for the Lord especially because you realize you can't raise these kids without understanding. Boy, when we first had Modesto, we thought, wow, okay, this is going to be easy because Virginia knows exactly what to do. She was raising her sisters. You know, she was helping out in the house. She knew how to cook. She knew how to do all those things. But it was hard especially when they got older and you have four of them running around and trying to make good decisions. And so we needed help. We had to learn things all over again. And so we got books. We listened to Dobson. We trained ourselves. We read, how do you raise godly children? How do you get them through their teenage years? I uh, Get Dobson books on how to get teenagers through their through those years. It's a great book and it will help you get them through because it's not about fighting. He, he, he gives us one picture. Is that they're, they're in the ocean being tossed all over the place with their emotion. You're in a boat. Stay in the boat. Don't get in the ocean with them because you'll drown. Stay in the boat and you just kind of help them along. You know, you, you pick and choose what is most important you, and you let other things go because their emotions are up and down and they're all over the place. And you have to just guide them through while you're in the boat. Otherwise, you'll go crazy. You'll pull out your hair. If you don't do that. And it worked for us. Children have a way of doing that. I really believe that, that the problem for most of us is that, that we're constantly trying to figure out who we are. Who am I? And why am I here? What should I be doing in life? What should I do right now? What is my calling? Where should I be at? Where should I go? I think the more you and I think about how we're doing, where we're going, what we're doing, how I should repair or prepare is just making references to self. It draws attention to self. The more we draw attention to self, the more misery we heap upon ourselves. Don't you get tired of that? Just trying to figure out, where am I going? What am I doing in life? Don't you get tired of that? Tired of hearing your own voice, dealing with the same old stuff over and over and having no purpose, having no direction at all? That's because God has created us not to be self-indulgent, not to be self-aware, but to totally please Him. When you are just pleasing Him, He will direct you in natural ways. He'll just lead you and guide you. (coughs) In in the book of Proverbs, there's scriptures about women, and I'm not trying to offend women at all. I'm making a point here, so don't take the offense. 
and, and it's God's word that says it. <clears throat> but sometimes women can be like a drippy faucet, you know. It doesn't, it, how does it go? You ever get a drippy faucet and try to sleep? <sighs> Listen to Virginia while you're trying to sleep. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you know, it's what Proverbs says, right? And, and so it's like the repetitiveness. Do you know God is a creator? A and you can ask him once and you know he hears you, right? He hears you. So you don't have to go like, God, did you hear me? God, I want to make sure you heard me. And he's like, I heard you the first time. Why do you keep saying it? Now, trust me. Stop asking. Trust me. If I want to get you there, I will get you there. And we forget that, that God is, is a person that we can come to, and he does hear us. Okay, he heard us. Now we have to just be patient and wait for him, right? That's who God is. And so, so we have to just please him because he leads in natural ways. And there have been many a times when you're going out to pick up groceries and all of a sudden you meet someone, you're like, oh, hey, wow, I haven't seen you in a long time. And now you've got this conversation, you're sharing with them. And next thing you know, they accept the Lord or they're coming to church. And you're like, wow, that was a divine appointment. Just go through life and God will lead you. Be faithful with what he puts before you. Philippians 2.13 says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. But when you're trying to figure it out and you're trying to do this and trying to do that, then it's just you. And you're like that little, I saw that on Facebook the other day. It's a, a new toy. It's that big old wheel. What do they call that thing? That goes around. You walk in it for the mice, but it's a dog one. When you got a dog on a leash, just put him in there. And he just running in circles in that wheel. And that's what we do in life. We just keep doing that. You know how many people uh, that I have met that's like, I'm still trying to figure out what I need to do. And they're just still sitting doing nothing. We need to just get busy with it and let God lead us in doing that. Ephesians 1.5, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, of his will. As John the Baptist said, I must decrease and he must increase. Just increase him in your life and let him lead you and he will lead you in this world. Godly people don't talk about themselves all the time. They don't. The happiest people are always those that are focused on other people. And I truly admire those who live to please others or please God and please themselves. The people who are not godly I'm sorry, the people who are the most godly and happy are the people who are just a joy to be around. They're just a joy because they know their purpose and their plan and they know they're in the perfect will of God. God has them right where they want to be. We need to be like Enoch. So Methuselah lived 100, verse 25, and 87 years and begot Lamech. Now Lamech means to the poor and lowly in the Hebrew, to the poor and lowly. So Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and he had a son. Lamech means to the poor and lowly. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed after he begot Noah. So Noah means what? Comfort or rest. Rest or comfort. So after he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 770 years, 77 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham and Jephthah, and we know we'll see them later down the road. So it starts with Noah. So let's look at these names. You wrote them all down, and if you put them in order, in that order that it came, this is what it says. The man appointed to death, sorrowful, from the presence of God. One comes down, dedicated. Dying, he shall send to the poor and lowly, rest and comfort. That's the gospel message right there. God wrote it within that genealogy. 
pretty amazing. Now, I don't, you know, make doctrinal truths out of this, but it is interesting when you find something like that. It's not something you go around and say, oh, you better believe in this or you're going to hell. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that is interesting that the Hebrew names, and, and if you look at this, I did a, uh, another study on it in another place in Genesis. You have to get down not just to the Hebrew word, but the root meaning of the words too, and you've got to do some digging to get these names out of there. But it is the gospel message. Jesus, Jesus came down to the poor and to give them rest and comfort. So you have that whole gospel message embedded within the genealogy here. So interesting. <clears throat> we'll see next chap next we'll see in the next chapter that the world is pretty much headed to devastation and destruction. That evil seems to be uh, winning over the morality of God and mankind. And God is only only going to accept one family, and that is Noah and his family along with uh, some animals that will be blessed for a ride. God saw no other option but to bring judgment on the human race and begin all over again with Noah. But we'll see that after chapter 6. Chapter 6, we're going to look at uh, these um, angels um, that populated the earth. Two things before I let you go. Have you truly surrendered your life to Jesus Christ? When I say surrender, I don't mean, yes, I've accepted him into my heart. Yes, he's my Lord. Yes, he's my Savior. No, I'm saying surrendering your life every day to him, saying, Lord, your will be done in my life. You lead me and guide me. I will obey your commands to the full. That's totally surrendering to the Lord. Giving him your free will. Walking with him. Have you walked with him? If you haven't, you need to. The Bible is clear, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us have sinned. We've inherited that from Adam. We have that sin nature. And because we are sinners, there's a wage and the Bible's clear, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we need the gift of God to come into our lives, Jesus Christ, because God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were sinners, while we fell short, Christ still died for us because he loved us. And so the evidence of his work being complete is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Bible is clear that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You'll be saved. And Ephesians says that he has created good works that you should then walk into. Ephesians 2, 9 and 10. And so be pleasing to the Lord. 